Welcome to Sounds Heal Podcast. I am your host, Natalie Brown, and today is the last day of July 2019, and it's been really a packed month for me. The past couple weeks, I was teaching and facilitating a sound healing workshop here in Iowa, and earlier this month, I attended the Gong Summit in Connecticut, which was full of master classes, performances, um, panels, and gong makers, and just really uh, an inspiring event. And my guest and I talk about that during this podcast. Today, I welcome Michael Bettine, who is a professional percussionist and explorer of sound, and with over 40 years experience playing all types of music. He got into gongs in the 1970s and incorporated it into his performances. He's released, I believe, over 60 recordings, over 40 under his name. He also has written for many publications and magazines, including Modern Drummer for years. He also runs blogs that are very helpful to gong players, musicians, and other artists. And I was so happy to meet him and attend his masterclass at the Gong Summit this July. So please enjoy my conversation with Michael Bettine as we look into the qualities of the gong, the spirit of the gong, and the current gong culture. Welcome, Michael Bettine. So I think where I'd like to start is maybe your life before discovering uh, the gong, you know, your musical and percussion background that led you to um, to just be in percussion and be a performer and be a writer. And then we'll get into when sure. you discovered the gong. Yeah, sure. Ah, this is going to be like a five hour <laughs> podcast, I guess. If I, uh, well, I've always been interested in music and um Eventually, I found my way to the drums when I was about 12 years old and totally fell in love with that and just jumped headfirst into it and played all through uh, high school and college and all that. And along the way, I had some um, introduction to the gong, like in you know school band and maybe there would be a song and you'd have to play a, a gong crash or something. And, but that wasn't such a, a, a big thing, but it was really when I was, I don't know, in my twenties playing progressive rock music and most of the drummers and the bands that I really admired, the drummers had expanded their setups with bells and gongs and other percussion instruments. And I really liked the idea and the sound so I bought two gongs and started using them in my band and really liked that so I went out and bought three more plus all kinds of bells and different sort of uh, orchestral type percussion things and that was great and it added a lot to the music and I love the sounds and all but along the way I, I just kept playing on the gongs because they were just fascinated me and that I think they just kind of pulled me in uh, then I started to investigate the gongs themselves more or trying to anyway this was all like pre-internet times this is, would have been back in the mid to late 70s into the 80s and it was it was hard to find any information really there was not a lot out there, and there was no gong culture at that time. Of course, there was there was a, some over in Europe. So, uh, Peisty, the gong company, um, a lot of the people who played their instruments in Europe were starting to use it more for therapeutic things and meditation and whatever. So, I contacted Peisty, wrote to them, and tried to get you know contact information on some of these people who were in like Pisces used to put out like a book with all their artists and that so 
I, uh, yeah, I tried to contact people, you know, writing letters and hoping I'd get a reply someday and, and that, and then, you know, and there were no books. I mean, it's people, you know, people today, you know, don't realize how lucky they are. You know, we've got the internet and we've got, you know, you can just Google stuff and there's all that info and you can go on YouTube and there's all these videos of people playing and, you know, it's, it's, it's so easy. But back then, even, even finding gongs was difficult. Um, Ludwig Drum Company imported and distributed all the uh, Piesty cymbals and gongs. So uh, most schools dealt with Ludwig because they carried the total percussion aspect, drums and vibes and marimbas and timpani, and then they had gongs and all that. So most schools had Piesty gongs. So those were available. But actually finding authentic Chinese gongs was extremely difficult, especially this is back before when China was still our, you know, our, our enemy. You know, we really didn't have good relations with them. So it's not like today where everything is, is made in China. <laughs> you just go to the store and you look at the label or the tag you know, or at the box and chances are it's made in China. Or back then, getting anything from China was extremely difficult. So finding real Chinese gongs was, was a very difficult prospect. Um, so yeah, so it, you know, you really, you really had to be motivated because uh, they're just the information and the, the instruments were so hard to come by. But the, there was a place in New York City called Carol Sound. And they were an instrument seller and they had a big rental business because back then uh, with the TV and radio studios in New York, they all had uh, a lot of you know live music that was still happening back then. They had uh, staff musicians and orchestras and all that. And that's where the percussionists would get all sorts of exotic instruments because they carried things from like India and Asia and you know, South America. So if you wanted some sort of a weird percussion instrument, there was a place to go. So that's where I got some of my gongs from because they, they carried, uh, they had some Japanese gongs and some Taiwan gongs and, and a few things like that and Thai gongs. Uh, so yeah, you, you really had to be motivated. And I guess I was because I was... <laughs> <laughs> I hunted down instruments and I tried to hunt down people who knew anything about them. And it just kind of went from there. Like I said, the, the gongs just kind of uh, took over and, you know, it just, I was just really into it. What do you think kind of drew you into looking for just different sounds and experimenting with, with metals? Well, I've just always been interested in sound. Mm. And I, I think a big part w with the metals is because they're longer sounds. They sustain. Mm -hmm. Where when you play drums, it's a very short sound. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you hit a drum and it goes bonk, and that's it. And you really have no control over the length of the sound because there is no length. A drum sound is mostly attack, and then it's gone. Whereas once you, you hit a gong or like a Burma bell or some sort of a bell, it rings out. And you have control over that because you can stop it at any point. So you can actually, you know, control the length of a note. Just like, you know, somebody playing a, a clarinet or a violin or something, you know, they can control how long their note is. So uh, I think part of the whole fascination was coming from playing drums for so long and playing all these short notes, and suddenly I, I've got these long tones that ring out. And it, it changed how I sort of viewed music, because suddenly it's like, oh, I can play with the space. I can play with the time, because these sounds hang on. They don't just, you know, I, I strike them and they're gone, but they hang on. So that gave me a whole other option for the music I was doing and 
you know, being able to combine those too. So I got long sounds and short sounds and it was just like, wow, this is just a whole different world mm-hmm. of sound mm-hmm. to me, you know, as a percussionist. Yeah. I mean, that really reminds me of your presentation at the Gong mm-hmm. Summit, you know, uh, the arcs of time, because uh-huh. as a percussionist, well, your job is to keep time. You know, if you're in a band, at right, least in right. most bands that I've played with, uh, you know, you really rely on the, the drummer to keep time. So it was your experience and probably a lot of freedom um, <laughs> not having to, to do that, just to allow that space and um, not just to have to tick the beat. Right. Well, and, and even, you know, within the context of playing in a band, the the metal sounds allowed me to expand my feeling of time. You know, like if, we, if we're playing a song where I, I could actually stop playing the drum set and not be just you know, playing uh, hundreds of notes all the time here and you know, maybe there was a quiet interlude or maybe it's a ballad or something and I could play these longer sounds quietly in the background and create some sort of a backdrop or cushion for the music that was going on. And it's like, that was just a whole different aspect. And it was, um, I don't know, it was just very expanded. I was able to, to look at, I think that's what really started my my whole thing with thinking of time because it's like, well, here's a whole different way of looking at time. I don't have to look at it in these really short notes and these short uh, measures of, of drum things. I can look at it in longer arcs. And then, you know, I think that's where I really started thinking about, you know, time as something you can work with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And is that what kind of, drew you um, perhaps out more and more into gongs and creating gong meditations? Well, part of that, and, and just the fact that it, it was so much fun to play. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I could just, you know, go in my studio and just play gong and bell sounds all day for myself. I, I just, I, I really, really just like metal for some reason. I have some affinity for metal. Now, like crystal singing bowls, I have no affinity towards. I'm not saying they're bad or anything. They're fine. And I know plenty of people who play them, and I've worked with people who play them. But I have no affinity for crystal singing bowls. But you give me like a metal bowl or some sort of ringing metal instrument, and I'm all over it. It's like, yeah. you know. So I think that was a big part is I just – just I don't know. I, I feel this strong relationship to resonant metal for some reason. It it totally fascinates me. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of wondering. You know what I've learned about the gong is about its all its subtleties and how much more sensitive it makes you, the player, mm-hmm. when you just have that that play time, is when you you lose track of time because gosh, they're just so complex. The metal sounds. They are, mm. yeah. I mean, there's there's a lot there, and you know, people come up to me after a meditation session or after a concert that I do or something, and they're always like, "I didn't know you could get all those sounds out of a gong," because everybody's idea of a gong is a big crash, either like at in a rock band at the end of a song. You know, the drummer reaches back and (laughs) hits his gong and makes a big crash. Or in a symphony orchestra, as some sort of an accent in in a piece, there's a big gong hit. And that's everybody's idea of it. Or, you know, the the infamous gong show from way back. Yeah, so that's everybody's idea of, of a gong. It's just this big, noisy crash. And people are are totally fascinated that you can get so many different sounds and small sounds and subtle sounds and beautiful sounds and all these different things out of the gong. And like, I never play the, the big crash. I never do that because I have no need, you know, to do that sort of a thing. So, so 
people are just, you know, they're fascinated by that because that's what they expect. You know, a lot of times they come to a meditation session and they kind of look at my setup and then they go to the far corner and put their mat down. (laughs) So I'm always saying, no, no, come right up here. Come right up in the front. You can be like right in front of me. That's the best spot. It'll be fine. This is not a rock concert. You know, you don't need earplugs. You don't have to worry about it. You know, so once in a while, I'll get a brave soul. Like that happened um, right before the Gong Summit. I played at this beautiful uh, Buddhist temple in Woodstock, Illinois. And some woman was in the back and I was saying, I had this big space in front of me. So I, I said, well, this is a room full of people, but I had this big space. I said, if everybody wants to come up here in the front, you know, please do. This is a good spot. It'll be great. And also one brave woman came up and put her mat like right in front of me. And then afterwards she was like, Oh, that was amazing. That was fantastic. Oh, you know, and so she was, she was glad she moved, you know, because she got the full effect, I guess you could say. But that's part of the fun of doing this too, for me as a musician is uh, showing people all these different aspects of these instruments, you know, that it's, it's not this super loud, noisy thing, you know, that there's music and there's beauty and subtlety and, you know, so many different sounds and tones that you can hear, you know, from, from all the instruments. And so it's, I don't know, it's part of, I guess you'd say my mission to sort of bring that idea to the people. Mm -hmm. And I love it when I I talk to people afterwards and they're just like, wow, you know, all those sounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think some people have had experiences that they've gone to gone (laughs) baths and, you know, it's just like constant (laughs) crashing. I mean, I've had some of my students even tell me that it's just like the whole time full force and, and gosh, I mean, um, so oh yeah, yeah, noise, noise, <laughs> noise. gonging, right? As 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 uh, some friends and I call it, noise gonging, mm-hmm. because people just go up there and just bash the crap out of the gongs, mm-hmm. and it's loud. Uh, I played in a place earlier this year where somebody, uh, another gong person, had been there like two months before, and. Afterwards, I was talking to the people, and one woman said, I brought my earplugs because the last time it was so loud in here because it was a small, it was a smaller room, you know, and and it was easy to overpower the room. She said, it was so loud in here. And again, the people were in the back of the room because they, they had experienced somebody playing loud noise gongs before, and they thought, well, Especially when they saw my setup, I think they thought, well, this is going to be another one of those. So I'm glad they, they took the chance to at least come back. <laughs> and But it was it was nice because a bunch of people thanked me for not being so loud. And I think that's a, a problem with a lot of people is they, they only know how to play one way. And they don't adjust for whatever room they're playing in. You know, if you play in this in a, in a huge room that can hold a hundred people, and you have a hundred people in there, they're going to absorb a lot of sound, and it's a big space with a lot of air. So you you know you're going to play louder, but if you play in a small studio that's going to hold fifteen, twenty people, and maybe it's got um, a low ceiling and very you know brick walls or mirrors on the wall or something so it's very reflective and lively i mean you have to adjust to that you have to learn how to you know play the room you're in and that's one thing i i talk a lot about to people and and i i teach about is you know you've got to pay attention to the room and the acoustics and Part of that is just experience and playing in a lot of different rooms. And, you know, you learn how they sound. I mean, I've played thousands of concerts and, and gong sessions in thousands of different types of rooms. So I've always paid attention to how it sounds, you know, wherever I'm at. And I've learned, you know, how to adjust to different size rooms and different 
you know, types of rooms. But I think that's a real important thing that a lot of um, people who are new to the gong, of course, they don't understand that. But it, I think that's a really important thing they need to learn is you have to learn how your setup sounds in a specific room. And even within a room, depending on where you set up, too. You know, you can set up on one wall and it'll sound one way and set up on a different wall and it could sound, you know, very differently, especially if you're in like a rectangular room or something. If you set up on the short wall or the long wall, you know, or what's behind you. If you set up in front of mirrors, that's very different than setting up in front of like um, wood or, you know, plaster or something like that. So it's, these things are, these are the type of things, you know, people have to learn, but it only comes through experience. But, you know, again, I think whenever you're in a room, you, you need to pay attention to what is this like? Oh, this is like a place I just played in, you know, a month ago or something. Maybe it will sound sort of similar in here. You know, so it's, it's, it's experience, but it's, I, I don't think a lot of people pay attention to that. Even if they've done 50 events, maybe they haven't really paid attention to the room because they, they approach them all the same and just mm -hmm. kind of bang away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that at least my idea of a, a gong bath or a gong meditation is that it actually allows space for the attack and space for the fade. And that's mm -hmm. what is relaxing, that there is this, this time to kind of bring you in because our, our world is very noisy already. So, it is. Yeah, yeah, it's the space in yeah. between things that I think is what is the most uh, de de-stressing and relaxing. Right. You know, and I don't want to add to people's noise. Right. <laughs> uh, well, when they come to a session, uh, for me, the whole idea is this is a time out from your world. Mm. And I want you to be able to relax. And I want you to just not feel assaulted by, by sounds. But I, I try to create pleasant sounds and harmonious sounds so that you can reach a, a state of deep relaxation and then you know that's where things happen and as i tell people you know if nothing else if you just fall asleep for that hour that's it might be the best sleep you've had in months and then maybe that's what your body just needed was just to fall asleep totally relax and then wake up refreshed well, let's talk about uh, people that are playing gongs. Can Some people get very overwhelmed at first because they think they need to get all these gongs. They see these great collections. But you can spend time with just one gong and really just find a whole infinite you know, amount of information from one gong. Um, so I don't know if that was your experience when you first got a gong or if you're ready to get more. Um, but what well, can somebody do with like just I, one gong? Yeah. Well, like I said, I, I ended up with like five <laughs> right away, yeah. really because of the musical aspects. I right. wanted five five different sounds to fit the music I was playing in a in a band and all. But uh, yeah, I mean, I've got hundreds of instruments, but it's collected over the span of you know forty forty five years. I think for most people, yes, you should start with one gong. And really explore that one and listen to it and develop a relationship with it so that you understand the gong and the gong also understands you. I don't know. I, I, I tend to personify all my instruments. I, I think they all have a spirit. And I think it's it really is a process of me getting to know the instrument and the instrument getting to know me and how I play it and all that. But I think you should start with one. And then after you've had it for a while, then you, you will know what sort of sound you want to add. You know, it's like if you buy two or three gongs right away, they might not really fit together the way down the road, you would want them to fit together. But let's say you buy like a, a 
a 30 inch chow gong and you play that and you get to know the sound and then your mind starts hearing a different sound and you go oh i'm hearing this other sort of sound what kind of gong would that be you know to go out and buy like a 26 inch chow gong would be kind of I don't think that would be good because you're going to have two things that are very similar and you're going to have a different pitch with each, but it's like, it's the same sound, but you know, you might hear something in your head and then you go, hopefully you can find a place that has some gongs and you start playing them. And then maybe you go, or you hear other people playing some stuff and you go, well, maybe I'd like to add a wind gong because that'll give me a whole different sound character I can play with. And then I've got two sounds that are very different. But I don't think it's easy to do that sort of thing until you really know the one gong and what it can produce. And then you can go, okay, it does all this, but it doesn't do that. And then you look for the gong that does what, you know, what your first gong doesn't do. At least that's how I tended to work. I, I was always looking for, okay, I have this sound. And but I don't have a sound like this. And even now, that's how I still buy stuff. I'm always looking for a, a sound that I don't have that will complement the sounds I already have. Even as a drummer, I was like that. You know, you see these these drummers with a setup, and they have like um, six or eight tom toms going across their set, and they're all the same type of drum just a different note and i was never into that when i played like six drums i had different types of drums because i'd have like a wood drum and a metal drum Mm -hmm. you know and a drum with one head a drum with two heads so when they all had different notes but then they also had a whole different sound character Mm. so you know that that I guess that's probably part of my musical DNA because that's how I I thought about sound, sort of from the beginning. But yeah, I think uh, you know take take one gong and just play the heck out of it and learn it and get to know it and then then you will know what your next step should be. Mm. And it might be a different mallet. Right. I mean, mallets. Oh, that too. Oh, yeah. Mallet choice. The best, the best um, thing one of my teachers ever said to me is if you want to change your sound, change your stick. Mm -hmm. And it's true, whether you're playing drums or gongs or any sort of percussion, you change the type of stick or mallet you're playing and that can completely change your sound. So then that's a whole nother world. So yeah, even before getting a second gong, I'd say get a, a second mallet. Yeah, at least. Or yeah. you know, get get some different types. Get mm-hmm. a, a big a big mallet for, suitable for the size of your gong, and then get a smaller one, and then get maybe some marimba mallets, or you know something like that, and then start to explore and and see you know see how much you can get out of one gong before you really move on to another. And it is infinite. So, I mean, you, you could play one gong for your whole life because the sounds are pretty infinite. I mean, I keep finding new sounds out of the same instruments I've been playing for you know, 20, 30 years. But I think that's a good step is work with one gong, get a few mallets, find all the different sounds you can. And then, like I said earlier, then you will know what sound or sounds you need other than that one, you know, what to look for in a different instrument. And it might not even be a gong. Maybe you'll buy a Burma bell or uh, a bowl or, or some sort of a, a sound plate or something as, as, you know, a different sound to go with your one gong. Maybe you might do that first before you go to a second gong. And that'll give you a whole different character. <laughs> completely I mean, like a like a, a big burma bell is going to be totally different than a gong and then even with those with the bowls and bells and that you have to do the same thing explore the sounds use different mallets um you know different techniques and all 
So tell us a little bit about your current collection. You know, if you were going to go perform um, an hour sound bath, uh, what what are you using these days? These days, I'm <laughs> using about 50 instruments. Oh, wow, okay. Uh, my approach is two ways. It's To me, it's very orchestral. I think of, as I my setup is like a small orchestra of sounds and it's also very i'm a visual person and i think of it like being a painter and each sound in tone is is a color so to me i i have a, a broad palette of colors to paint sound with but i use what do i use two four six i use like eight gongs uh, because I like to have a, a variety of tones on the gongs, different types and different sizes. And then I use a lot of bowls and bells. I was joking at the gong summit because uh, people were like uh, Michener and other people were talking about, you know, getting the bigger gongs to play in the first octave. And I, I've gone the completely opposite direction. I'm, I'm working more in the, uh, fifth, sixth, and seventh octave. I, I've been buying a lot of higher sounds because I really like the high bell type sound. So I'm, I'm using a lot of bells. I, I probably use like 10 Burma bells and I have uh, some copper clad iron bells. I have a bunch of heavy bell cymbals. I have bell plates. I've got some instruments I've made that I use. Uh, a lot of uh, Japanese rin bowls, small ones, like two to eight, eight inches in diameter. So I, I really like the high sounds. And I, I've put everything together in, in melodic sets because I'm always thinking uh, melody and harmony. And that's always been a big aspect of, of how I think about music. And so, like, I've got... All my, my Burma bells all fit together in a melodic set. And I've got different melodies I play on them. The same with uh, my copper clad bells. I, and I bought all these over, over time. It's not like you can go out and buy, you know, a set of bells or Burma bells and they're all in some sort of, uh, you know, tuned progression. But I, I just I just keep picking up different ones that I hear and I go, oh, this will fit with the ones I have. So I've, I've built up all my instruments over time as a melodic set. And then all the instruments fit together, the whole you know, 50 or so that I'm using all fit together as, as one melodic entity. You know, it's almost like a piano with 88 keys. Well, I have, you know, 50... 50 keys or something you know it's so it's uh, that's a big thing for me is i'm always thinking melody and harmony and how everything fits together at least in this context now if i'm playing some sort of an improv concert i may introduce different instruments that are maybe a little more noise based or dissonant or that because that's the type of sounds i want for that situation but for for a meditation i'm always thinking harmony I, I want pleasing sounds i want them to work together because i want the people to be able to relax so i don't i don't want to bring in some sort of a sound that's you know people are going to jump mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. like I, I would never bow a gong right for a meditation ses session because that's kind of a dissonant eerie sound and it would just you know people are laying there all relaxed and suddenly they go mm -hmm. with, a, with a you know with a cello bow or something on a gong and it would t totally break the mood so yeah i mm -hmm. wouldn't do that mm -hmm. yeah. and do you kind of have a maybe a set order that you normally do or is it usually just based on how you're feeling is it different every time it, it's a little of both. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now with the instruments I'm using, I've developed a certain flow. Right. That seems to work. 
I, and I like moving from certain things to other things in changing the sounds in certain directions. So I've developed a sort of flow. But within that, there's a lot of improvisation. So I can change how long I do something. Like if something is really feels right, I'll do it for a long time, like a certain gong. Like sometimes I'll be playing my Jupiter gong and it's just like, this is the sound that's needed. And I'll just, I'll concentrate on that more because I can tell that's the sound that I should be playing. And other times, you know, sometimes there's things I won't touch. They'll be sitting there. I won't hit them at all because it's, it's just, it's not calling out that it's a sound that's needed. And then, like I said, other times I'll concentrate on the same sort of instrument or sound a lot because I feel that is the sound that's needed. So it's, it, to me, it's, it's, it's a very intuitive process of paying attention. So, again, part of it is, uh, well, there, there's three factors I work with. One is the room. What does the room sound like? Like I, I did a session what was it last week? And it was a very lively room. It was a smaller, rectangular, very long room. And it was very lively and with a really nice reverb in it. So certain instruments just sounded beautiful in there because of the, the way the, the sounds moved around the room. And so that, that kind of set the tone for, for one thing, how I played. Another aspect is how I'm feeling. You know, what is my mood? What can I bring at any given moment? You know, what can I bring to the session? And then the third and most important thing is the people there. You know, what are they bringing to this? What are their needs and intentions? I really try to pick up on that. And Again, it, for me, it's a totally intuitive thing. I mean, and I've been this way all my life. I, I'm very intuitive, and I've always been aware of everything that's going on around me. And we could go down a rabbit hole and talk for hours about about this and all all of that. But suffice to say, it, it's intuitive, and I'm always paying attention. I'm listening to the room, and I'm feeling whatever you want to call it, the vibes or intentions that the people are giving off. So, you know, to a great extent, I, I know what's happening in the, in the room, even though the way my setup is, for the most part, my back is to the people. Because the gongs are in the back, and then and the bells are in the back, and then in the front I have a table with, with uh, small instruments like the singing bowls and rind bowls and shakers and that. So sometimes I'm facing the people, but for most of the time I'm I'm facing away. And I know some people have you know have commented about that to me. You know, well, you should face the people and you know play the other way. But this is what works for me, and I'm totally I'm totally aware of what's going on behind me. <laughs> you know, I I don't. And anyway, I, I play with my eyes closed a lot anyway, so it, it wouldn't matter if I'm facing people or not. So. But I'm always aware of what's going on. I mean, I have a real good sort of radar for that. And to me, that that's really important. And and that's just the way I work, because like I said, I've been that way my whole life. Since some of my earliest memories are, are um, things like that. I'm just being aware of my surroundings, being hyper aware of my surroundings and just knowing things that nobody else knew knowing things intuitively. So I really work with that. And that works for me. It might not work for somebody else. And, you know, when, when I teach people, and like at the Gong Summit, I think I mentioned it there too. It's like, you know, this is what I do. This is how I do it. it you know, it might not work for you this way. Because I try to realize, you know, everybody's everybody's different, and we all have different capabilities, different senses, and we all operate in different ways. So, you know, now I watch a lot of other gong players and bowl players and that, and I look at what they do, and it's like, well, yeah, I don't work that way at all. But 
that's working for them. So that's fine. You know, I, I'm not going to say it's wrong because it's not like I do it, but it's like, it's, it's different. And you know, that they experience the world in their own way. So they're reacting to it that way. Mm-hmm. And I experience it in my way. So I react to it that way. Right. It's like the, the instrument is showing you your way, <laughs> your mm-hmm. way together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And again, for me, everything, it goes back to all the music I play. I play a lot of improvised music with other people, you know, where you just get up there and play. Not, not a jam thing where you say, okay, we're going to play this song and it's going to be in this key and blah, blah. And you go off. No, just get up and just start playing. I do a lot of improvised music and it's, it's all intuitive and it's all just paying attention. I'm paying attention to what's going on. It's it's really no different than when I do a, a meditation session. I'm just paying attention to everything. What's it sound like in the room? What are the other musicians playing? Um, where are they going with what they're doing? How are the people reacting to what's going on? You know, so it's the same thing. It's just really, it's paying attention. You know, it's like if if you're out in the woods. Let's say you were lost in the woods. What would you do? Well, you first thing you hopefully would do would start paying attention to what's going on around you. You know, like, uh, where's the sun in the sky? Maybe I can find out what direction, <laughs> you know, to go. Um, where did I come from? Maybe I can figure out how to backtrack, you know, and listening for sounds. Oh, is that a voice I hear in the distance or a car or something? You know, it's just, it's the way, you know, People used to be more that way in the world. It was just totally paying attention to what was going on around them. Yeah, I'm curious, as somebody that's new, you know, kind of new to this gong world, and after going to the gong summit, it appears to be really a time of gong revolution. As somebody that's been into gong since the 70s, how do you feel after the gong summit? How do you feel about the gong cult- culture right now and uh, this whole uh, really blossoming and all the I'm, aspects of it. Yeah. I'm really encouraged now, mm-hmm. even more than I was, mm. especially meeting everybody there, mm-hmm. especially people like you and, and everyone else who I've known on Facebook <laughs> for a long time. Sure. You know, we have all these virtual friends now meeting people in person talking to everybody, interacting with everybody and all that. I'm extremely encouraged about what's happening. Uh, And as I was telling somebody there, I think, you know, culture, music is important to human beings. It has been as, as far back as we can go in history. Music has always been a part of being human for some reason. You know, it's in our DNA. And we can look through history and see different sort of cultures. Like if you go back to our grandparents and great grandparents, every, almost every house had a piano, you know, and you get together for the holidays, Christmas, Thanksgiving, whatever. And what happened after dinner, everybody went to the parlor, somebody played the piano, everybody sang along to the songs. So, you know, there's this big social element of that. So everybody had a piano in their home. That was a big thing. And everybody knew how to play piano, at least a little bit. And then we move a little further along, and especially we get to like to the 60s and all that, and the guitar became the big instrument. And everybody had a guitar. And then what would you do? You'd go to a, a, a picnic or a campfire, and somebody would bring their guitar along so they'd pull it out and everybody would sing songs or even at home again the the guitar sort of replaced the piano and people would somebody would pull out a guitar and you'd sing folk songs and you know and, and there was that sense of community and that's been a big i think that's an important thing for people to understand is music has always been about community it's not about playing music by yourself it's about playing with other people and for other people and having this sense of community. So now with the Gong Summit and with everybody there and people you know, trying out gongs and playing and everybody standing around listening and all this, I really felt 
that same sort of sense of community and sharing. And I, I and I, we see so many people now coming into gongs and buying gongs and all that. I mean, you look at a business like Gongs Unlimited. 20 years ago, there was nothing like that. He started this business and now he's like a, a multi-bazillion dollar business because everybody's buying gongs. So I see sort of the gong as the new folk instrument, you know? And hopefully people will go camping and they'll bring their gong and they'll play it out in the woods and they'll play it by the campfire for everybody else, you know, that sort of thing. Or you'll come over to somebody's house and they'll have gongs set up and everybody go, oh, this is neat. Can I play? And people will play the gongs. So I don't know. I kind of see this as hopefully a progression, you know, moving from like piano to guitar and now the gong. It's its time. It's the new everybody instrument. And especially because, I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to have any special training to, to make a pleasant sound on a gong. You know, even like a guitar, you have to, you have to know some chords or on a piano, you have to know some chords or something, but the gong, I mean, you can, you can just strike it and get a pleasant sound. So I think it, it's hopefully it can kind of become uh, the instrument for everybody. Now, if you go to, to Southeast Asia, where um, the gong is a tribal instrument. You go to like Thailand and you know that whole that whole area there, Vietnam, Laos, and where, where it's still very much a tribal society. I, the, the big thing was every they didn't have guitars, they didn't have pianos. You know, if you go around the world, indigenous people made instruments out of the materials they had. Well, they had metalworking. And they made gongs in Asia and India and, you know, that whole region, gongs and bells. But like a lot of places, everybody had gongs in their home. Like, like I said, like in, you know, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, that whole area, all, all people had gongs. And then when they had births and weddings and deaths and harvest celebrations and all these sort of things, everybody came out. And they brought their gongs and they all played together and they played music to celebrate things. And they had specific music, you know, that you had to learn for all these occasions because you wouldn't play a funeral song at a harvest celebration or something. But it, again, it was a, it was a community thing because everybody would come out and do that. So, you know, everybody had their gongs and hopefully in the West here now, North America, Europe, uh, even Central and South America, whatever, we can sort of start having that kind of a culture where people all have gongs. And then, you know, and then when you get home from work and you're like, <laughs> you know, you're all wound up and you're angry at your boss or something or somebody cut you off in traffic when you were driving home, come home, play your gong, you know, and chill out and feel better. Yeah, I think just uh, all the potential I saw at the Gong Summit has to do with just that collective excitement. You know, there really, was really, really. just this I passion mean, for the Gong. It was there was such a buzz in the yeah, air. Yeah. I mean, it, it was like uh, just being there. You got high just mm -hmm. from from the vibes, mm -hmm. and I'm excited to see the results of the gong summit over like the next year because now we've all gone back home and hopefully we we can all continue to carry that message and spread it more and people will present more meditation sessions and present more workshops for people who are interested in that and and now that we've all met and we're connected in person i mean that that makes a to me a big difference uh, that we can continue to network and work together more. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was invited to go a lot of places now right. from people who were there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm following up on all of those things. And, you know, people want me to come play. They want me to come teach. Uh, you know, that's great because it's like uh, we have this 
this community now and i mean everybody's looking forward to the next summit you oh, know and it's like yeah. okay <laughs> I got go. my, here's my credit card uh, can i pay for it right. you know, everybody's ready to do it because yep. it was such a, a really an amazing experience i mean i didn't know what to expect you know how it would be it was just like this is an unknown there's never been a, a gathering like this with like 90 people um, locked into a resort for you know, <laughs> five days. I mean, because I never left. You know, nobody ever left. No. We were there. You know, and and to have, you know, I was going from like eight in the morning till two in the morning every day, yeah. practically. You mm-hmm. know, and it was it was. I didn't know what to expect, and it was like it was the most amazing experience of my life. Yeah, it was wonderful. Mm-hmm. And it was just, I, it was like, wow, you know, and it was like, and we were a tribe. Absolutely. I think that was, that was really the best part because we were in person and we were communing and communicating and we became a tribe. And uh, I think a big idea from that is keeping, keeping the tribe together and adding people to it, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm excited to see like, you know, a year from now, the results of all this in hopefully how we've all gone back to our communities and planted more seeds of the gong and that we will nurture and water those seeds and, you know, to see what sprouts and grows a year from now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's very exciting. Just uh, still processing it all, you know? Oh man. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, it, It, there was so much to take in. Yeah. It was it was just from everybody. I mean, I watched everybody. It wasn't just the other presenters. Mm-hmm. When people were trying out gongs, I was watching them. And I helped I helped people pick out gongs and we talked about, you know, this gong and that gong and playing things and it was just like so much information and I don't know, and since the end of it I've been I've been like totally busy. Next week, I pretty much have off finally. So next week, I'm going to really start to sit down and and work on a lot of ideas that I had. And warning to everybody was there. I stole all your good ideas. Okay, (laughs) I stole all your good moves. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. But I'm going to change them. I'm going to simulate them and make and you know change them to, to. to fit me i'm not going to copy everybody but right. it's like oh i got a lot of good ideas so I'm, I'm excited to finally get my studio next week and it'll be laboratory week you know i'm just going to work on ideas and i bought all kinds of new instruments too i gotta fit into my setup right. uh, i've been buying a lot of instruments lately mm-hmm. i mean my wife's kind of freaked out because i've had boxes show up all the time <laughs> of of all kinds of instruments but I'm here. I'm hearing new things, so I, I want to pursue that, and so it'll be exciting. This next, oh, especially the next month, is really. I'm going to do a lot of work on just things. I got a new recording in mind. I, I want to work on, and I've got this whole different, different idea for me. So I'm excited to pursue that. And, cool. Yeah, and it, you know, and it it, it never stops. Mm-hmm. And that's part of the fun. I mean, like I said, I've been playing gongs since the mid seventies and I keep finding new sounds and new rhythms and new ideas. And I'm, I'm, I'm never bored by it. And I keep working at it too. You know, it's not like I'm complacent and I just sit here. Well, yeah, I got my bag of tricks and I'm just going to go with that. It's like, no, I'm always looking for new stuff. And I'm always trying to learn. Like I said, at the summit, I watched everybody because I wanted to see how other people approach things because I know I do things from my personal perspective, my background and all this. And I know everybody else comes from a different space. So I was watching everybody play any sort of instrument there because I wanted to I wanted to learn, well, how do other people approach this and how do they do things? So, you know, I've been doing this most of my life and it's, you know, I'm, I'm still a learner. I'm still a neophyte. I mean, this is, I'm a beginner because there, there's, 
so much you can keep learning. And I, I, I played this, I played this instance, interesting gig a little over a week ago after we finally got back here, I played at this little uh, vegetarian restaurant downtown here. And I did this, this totally improvised concert. So I brought a very skilled down version of my setup and I brought some hand drums and some other stuff. And I kind of look at that as like a laboratory because I get to experiment with sounds a lot. And I was getting sounds out of the gongs I play out of the time, the two that I brought, I was getting sounds I'd never heard before. So it's like, okay, these are really cool sounds. And it's like paying attention. Okay, how did I get these sounds? How can I recreate them in the future if these are sounds that I want to use? You know, so it's it's always learning. And you know, and I, I'm just I know I'm a constant learner. I, I read more books than most people I know. I mean, I'm currently reading five or six different books you know, at the same time. And um you know, I'm always trying to learn more and more. And I think that's that's the a real fun part of this. It's a rabbit hole. If you right. really, you're Alice in Wonderland, and you just go down that hole, and there's a whole nother world of sound and and vibes and just the universe. If you really want to jump into the the whole gong thing, and if you do jump in and run with it, and you know you could run forever. Mm. Well, you're also, besides reading a lot of books, you've also been a writer for for many, many years. Writing yes, for, I have. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's actually how I first discovered you. You know, I don't remember if it was The Way of the Gong or Art as a Spiritual Practice blog, but you also uh -huh. blog quite a bit, too, and I, I really appreciate them because, you know, in a way they're um, really to the point uh -huh. and kind of minimalistic but also very helpful and inspirational. Um, maybe you can just kind of tell your listeners about the writing that you do and, and what sure. you share online. Mm -hmm. uh, well, first, thank you for those comments. Yeah. I really appreciate it. And that was another nice thing about just to get back to the Gong Summit. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I look at the internet and like I, I write three blogs. Mm. Don't ask me why, but because you know, <laughs> I'm a writer, so I write three blogs. <laughs> But I, I, I look at that, at the blogs as like putting a, a letter in a bottle and throwing it on the internet ocean. I mean, you never know if it lands or where it lands. And you often don't know if anybody really reads it or gets anything out of it, you know, because people don't don't always comment on it. But at the Gong Summit, it was it was really nice to have a lot of people come up to me and say, hey, I read your blogs and, oh, you know, it changed my life. I get a lot out of it. It really helped me and all this. And, you know, as a re as a writer, it was very rewarding to just find out that, yeah, I'm making some sort of an impact out there. You know, people people are getting something out of it. So that was nice. But yeah, I've been writing almost all my life too. I mean, as as a as a kid, I I was always writing stories and coming up with with things like that. And then I remember, like in high school, I, I took journalism and I ended up on the school paper. So I started writing for that, and I just really was fascinated by the whole thing of writing and words and putting words together. So I've been writing you know, for such a long time. And then I started writing for magazines back in about 1983, I think it was. I had read something in a, in, a, in a drum magazine and I said, this is before we were married, but I said to my wife, I said, I can write better than this because I thought it was a horrible article, you know? And she said, well, why don't you? And I was like, okay. You know, so I put together a whole bunch of my ideas and sent it off to the drum magazine and they got back to me and they said hey yeah we'd like to do some stuff with you so that started that and I was writing regularly doing mostly feature interviews with people but also some technical pieces and reviews and stuff like that and I've ended up writing for a lot of different music magazines both uh 
I've written for almost all the drumming magazines out there, plus uh, other music publications. And then I ended up writing a few books. And yeah, that's just, it's been pretty concurrent with everything else I've done. But the fascinating thing, it's, it was, that happened to me is one day I realized it's, it's all the same thing. Everything I do is all the same thing, whether I'm uh, making music or, you know, putting together notes or putting together words, it's, it's all the same thing. So to write the blog in some ways is really no different than to play the gongs because it all comes from the same source. It's just expressed in a little different medium. But yeah, it's fascinating. I, I don't know. It's uh, I just love to write. And part of it, especially with the blogs, was, um, I don't know, I look, I look back at, you know, on my career as a musician, and there were a lot of people who helped me along the way. And as I said, you know, with the gongs, but also with the drums, I was writing letters to musicians I admired, you know. I'd have a question about something, and, and I'd, you know, write a, letter and put a stamp on it and send it to them and you know i would get replies from these famous people Mm. and they they answered my questions and they were very helpful and and i never forgot that so it's like i mean i'm kind of at that point in my career you know um i want to give back you know the knowledge i have to people so part of writing the blogs was just a brain drain for my own um purpose just to write it but the other part was just like i want i want to share this stuff i know share these ideas um and if people can get something from it that would be great you know if i can help them along their path you know maybe they have a question or maybe there's something they haven't even thought of and they read a blog and they go oh i never thought of that wow i'm gonna try that or you know or boy, I had a problem with this and you read the blog and go, oh, this will help me with, you know, the problem I'm having or something. So, you know, it's just, if if I can, if I can just help people along their musical path and give them ideas in in their, you know, in their artistic path, like art as a spiritual practice came out. That one was more, that one's more of like just almost like a personal thing. (laughs) But I was kind of writing for myself at first and it's like, well, I should blog this because maybe somebody will get something out of it too. Because maybe they're maybe maybe they're in the same sort of space I'm at. So that's not that's designed to kind of cover any sort of art, whether you write or paint or dance or you know, or even just doing the dishes. You know, there's an art to that. I mean, so yeah, just trying to. I don't know, trying to give back, I guess, because like I said, people, so many people have helped me along the way. And now I'm at an age and a point where, um, well, it's funny when when I was, when I was a young drummer, I always played with the older people, Mm -hmm. you know, like when I was a teenager, I played in this band that was all the band directors. It was Mm -hmm. a big band Mm -hmm. and it was all the band directors from all the schools in the area. So they were all, who knows, I was like maybe, you know, 18 years old or whatever. And they were all probably 40s, 50s, 60s, you know. So, and I did that a lot. I played in a lot of groups where everybody was much older than me. I was the younger person. And now things have turned around where I'm the older guy. I just turned 64 in April. So I'm the older guy. And I go out and play these improv things and I'm playing with people who are my kids age, you know, they're in their twenties and their thirties. So, and it, so that's kind of, uh, you know, fascinating to me that uh, things have changed and now I'm, I'm in the, in the position I used to look at. So, yeah. So I, I like the same thing with like the summit, you know, it's like, I talk to everybody. And people ask me a million questions, and I was glad to, to you know, try to answer them and, and give advice or whatever I could. And it's, um, yeah, I just, I want to give back to everybody and help everybody along their, their path.
And I think that's important because, I mean, there are no secrets. You know, you, you might know of musicians or hear about musicians who, you know, don't want to show what they do because people are going to steal their stuff, especially like guitar players and stuff like that. And it's like, it's like there are no secrets. Everybody can, people can figure out what anybody's doing. And the thing is, and, and people can copy what you do, but they're never going to be you. You know, like you, you look at any famous musician, like let's let's pick like a guitarist, like Eric Clapton, world renowned, one of the most famous, you know, rock and blues guitarists in the world. And people can copy him, but they're never going to be him. You know, so it's the same, you know, with, with playing gongs and that. I mean, I'll show anybody anything. And I do that. I Sometimes after a meditation, I'll, I'll teach many lessons to people if there's time, because they'll ask me about stuff. And I'll show them, oh, yeah, here's how you play a singing bowl. Because I got a singing bowl. I can't get a sound out of it. You know, I'll show them how. And they go, oh, okay, I'm not doing it right. Or, you know, show them how to play a gong and do a certain thing. And it's like, I don't know. I'm not afraid anybody's going to go home and steal my stuff because it's like I stole most of it from somebody else, you know? And it's like we, we all stand on it you know, the shoulders of everybody before us. So I'm not, you know, there's no secrets. So I'm always glad to tell anybody anything if if I know something about it. That's great. Well, how can people find out where, where you're going to be, what you're doing next? I know you're um, coming over to Iowa. Uh, yes, here in, in a couple August. weeks. Yeah. That'll be fun. Yeah. Uh, well, my website's the best place. Uh, it's gongtopia.com. And that's got everything on it. It's got my schedule, so you can find out where I'm playing or teaching a workshop or whatever. It's got links to all three of my blogs. It has grown massively, and it's probably about a million pages by now. <laughs> so if you want to know all kinds of stuff about gongs and sound there's a you can go on there there's pages for all that i have a page called the sound chamber which has some tells you how to do stuff like make mallets and how to build a stand out of gibraltar stand parts and you know all this sort of stuff so there's there's learning stuff on there uh there's links to my music page if you i've got I don't know, way too many recordings out there, but all kinds of recordings. You can listen to them. You can download them, that sort of stuff. I've got a video page on YouTube that has, I don't know, probably 80 or 100 videos by now. So there's a link to that. So, yeah, there's a lot of information out there. And when I actually get the time, which I don't know what that is, <laughs> uh, I've got a, I'm working on a whole new video course oh cool it, it's sort of uh, everything i've ever learned and I, I don't know i started working on this two years ago and had a whole bunch of interruptions along the way but i don't know i've, I've shot probably 30 or 40 videos so far and they're anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes of video wow and it's just going to cover i don't know it's just kind of like i'm emptying my head mm-hmm completely it's like this is everything that i can remember that i know about gongs and bells and percussion sounds and all this so hopefully that will see the light of day later this year awesome yeah wow but now after the gong summit a lot of people kicked my butt there yeah. about <laughs> things oh yeah and i have a book coming out a new book about gongs and all this too which uh Sheila Whitaker was kind enough to uh, remind me about because mm -hmm. uh, I, I asked her if she had any of her books and she with her. And so I got one of her books from her. And then she said, well, Michael, when is your book coming out? Mm -hmm. Because I've been promising this book on my website probably for seven to 10 years. I've been oh, promising wow. this book. <laughs> so thank you, Sheila. You gave me a nice <laughs> kick in the pants there. And yes, um. I'm going to concentrate on that too. Yeah. Sort of like, you know, and, and Mitch was saying about 
you know, just getting things done. Right. And I, I see that too. Like I said, you know, now I'm older. So it's like, uh, I wish I had 50 more years just mm-hmm. because I have 50 years of ideas. And just so many opportunities. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But I, I've, I've prioritized things. There's all these great ideas I have for projects that I've just taken off my list. It's yeah. like, I can't do everything, you know, even if I lived 50 more years, I can't, I probably can't do it all. So I'm going to concentrate on like the top five things. And that's like the book, the video course, and a couple of new projects and, and actually get them done. And when they're done, then okay. And then I can go down to the next five (laughs) and get those done. Right. But there'll probably be a new five by then. But, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but yeah, so I've I've cut my, my to-do list way down and it's like, yes, all these things I've talked about, I'm, I'm going to do and get them done. Great. Yeah. Great. Great. That's a good way to do it. No matter what age you are. (laughs) Oh, definitely. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, and it's hard because there's so many distractions today. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I used to teach drums and it was really hard with my students because these students would come to my lesson and they'd be exhausted because they'd have school and then they'd have like, soccer or basketball or something before their drum lesson and then after their drum lesson they're going to do something else and it's like you know what ever happened to just being a kid you know Mm -hmm. they don't even have time to do anything (laughs) really i've had kids i had kids fall asleep in the lessons because they're overworked yeah no it's true it's 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 a shame and and i see you know all of us adults with that same problem so Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's the big thing. Come to one of my gong sessions and get out of that. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Take an hour out of your life and just, there's nothing to do except just be and exist in the moment. Yeah. <laughs> well, those of the listeners in Iowa come to the Unity Center in Des Moines on Tuesday, August 13th. Otherwise, just follow the calendar on gongtopia.com and right see where you can catch michael or wait for his videos (laughs) yes (laughs) and see him online yep right yeah well awesome thank you so much michael i really really appreciate your time yeah oh yeah it was so nice to meet you in person you too you too and i've been listening to your blog or your podcast since it started oh thank you i discovered it you know and i realized it this morning i've probably listened to each episode at least twice Mm. And mm-hmm. some of them, you know, three times because there's so much information. Right. From yeah. All the, the, the very interesting people. Very unique. Uh, you've talked to. Yeah. And, yeah. And there's always stuff to learn. So mm-hmm. I, I'm a big podcast person. I listen to a lot of podcasts yeah. on music and arts mm-hmm. and philosophy and that. But yeah, your podcast is great. And, oh, thank you. Uh, Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of it. I Absolutely. really appreciate that. Absolutely. And I can't wait to see you in a couple of weeks. Yes, that'll be fabulous. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Sounds Heal Podcast. You can keep up to date by going to soundshealstudio.com, on Facebook, Sounds Heal Studio. You can listen to new music and podcasts monthly on YouTube. Sounds Heal Studio, Natalie Brown. Be well and stay tuned.